Well, if you guys have your Bibles uh, or if in your, in your worship guides, go ahead and grab your message notes, follow along. I want to start a message uh, series today on the book of Ephesians. Every, every so often, the Lord will lay a, a specific book upon our hearts, and then uh, we want to just kind of take time to walk through because there's absolutely some profound, life-changing truth and theology and even practical things uh, found in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. I want to start in uh, John chapter 8, verse 31. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth, and the truth will do what? will set you free. You may have heard that before, but I want you to think about it in a new light this morning. The truth that you know will set you free. So how, how exactly does the truth set you free? Well, lot, lots of ways, but today we're going to focus on the topic of our identity, who we are, specifically our identity in Christ. So I want to invite you guys to say that with me, identity. Okay, say it like you mean it. Identity. Identity. All right, learning the truth about who you are. Learning the truth about what, what God says about you. And actually believing it has the potential to transform everything in your life. Okay, so have you ever thought that you're just not enough? You're not smart enough, you're not good looking enough, you're not spiritual enough. You ever had those thoughts? Or maybe you have thought um, that you let other people's opinions of you control you. Have you ever made a decision based upon what somebody else thought you should do or expected? Or have you ever sinned and felt an overwhelming guilt and shame after that and just condemnation? Well, these things are indications to us that we might be going through an identity crisis. You ever seen those uh, Jason Bourne movies about the Bourne identity? Okay, I love those movies. It's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, but, but there was an identity crisis, right? He didn't know exactly who he was. He didn't. He was figuring things out. And some of us here may be still trying to figure out who exactly we are. And that's what Ephesians is going to talk to us because uh, when we go through an identity crisis, it leads us to, 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 to think about some things differently. Number one, when we're going through a crisis, take, jot this down if you're taking notes, we've, we've been condi- conditioned to only expect the ordinary or the routine. Like when life just seems filled with just routine and the possibility of something really good happening is just not there. Everything just seems blah. And we can forget about the goodness and the greatness of our God. And we can forget about his passionate love for us. And we can forget that he has already blessed us in so many ways and continues to bless us day after day. And sadly, we can begin to live our lives with no faith. We can begin to live our lives with no anticipation to see his power working in profound ways in our lives. We can live with no expectation of of experiencing his goodness and his love in our lives. Identity crisis. Number two, we've been conditioned to believe that we are less than God says we are. That we are less than God says we are. Sometimes we live way below what God says we are. Sometimes we believe lies like, I'm not valuable. I'm not loved. I'm not important. I'm not blessed. I'm not secure. I'm not included. I'm not gifted. When we believe those things, what is that? It's identity crisis. Number three is this. We've been conditioned to think we have no purpose. That's a lie from the devil. We have a purpose. And sometimes we struggle with questions of why am I here on this earth? Why, did, why, am, I, why am I here? Does, doesn't God love me and have a good plan for me? Well, why am I not living that out? I'm just taking up space. I'm just collecting dust. I'm, I'm doing nothing. I'm being nothing. I'm feeling nothing. And it's identity crisis. Number four, we've been conditioned to believe God is not who he says he is. 
This is also a lie. Because we start believing that he's really not our loving father. He's really not that good. We're really not a beloved child of his. He's really not faithful. He's more like my earthly father. Than he's, he's pretty wishy-washy. He's, he's just not really all-powerful. He's not really all-knowing. He's not faithful. He's just this mystical big guy in the sky. He's a little weak. He's a little dumb. He's a little slow. And God's just not who he says he is. And my friends, I got to tell you, that's a lie. That's a lie. And so when we believe those things, what does it cause us? It causes us to feel insecure. It causes us to feel unloved, to feel empty, to feel lost when we believe those things. This is an identity crisis. And the truth is that I want you to be aware of this morning is this. This is up on the screen. One of the primary goals of the enemy is to steal the identity of the believers. That's what he wants to do. The devil wants you to believe lies. Because guess what? When you believe lies, you empower the liar. I'm praying that we just cast down and we reject the lies of the enemy. We reject the lies of the enemy and say, no, no, no. I am who God says that I am. And I can do what God says that I can do and all these other lies and all these other things that we've been conditioned to 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 believe we're going to cast those off in the name of Jesus so as we get into Ephesians chapter 1 the letter of Ephesians is is a, a letter that Paul wrote while he was in prison to the church in Ephesus many call the book of Ephesians the Grand Canyon of Scripture it's as wide as it is deep. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter while he was in prison, and in six short chapters, he, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, communicates some of the richest, most important truths in all, in all of Scripture. And a quick overview is like this. Ephesians chapter 1, 2, and 3 really focus on who we are in Christ, our identity and our calling and our purpose. And then you move into chapters 4, 5, and 6, and it's very much the focus is on how should we live our lives then? If this is who we are, how then should we live? And it's more practical. So let's go ahead and start in verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 1. It says this, Paul, the, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So just first off, he just says, hey, everybody, my name is Paul. I am an apostle. What does that word apostle mean? It just means one who has been sent, one who has been commissioned by God to do something uh, to further his kingdom. And basically, Paul is saying, I am a man on a mission. I've got something specifically that I am called to do and I'm here and I'm doing and I'm saying what I'm doing and what I'm saying by the will of God. Now, typically when you hear somebody say by the will of God, you hear it and it's, it's something good that's happening. Like, like we bought that house at an amazing price by the will of God, right? Or... We got a full ride scholarship to that amazing college by the will of God. Or I met that beautiful girl named Ashley by the will of God. Or I won the Instapot by the will of God. Right? But what about when we lose that job? What about when not so good happens, things happen? What about when we get sick? What about when we have to go to court and we pay a fine? Or what about when things fall apart? Can we say it with the same ease? It was by the will of God. You see, Paul had no problem. Listen, Paul saying, I'm here and I'm chained and I'm in prison and I'm writing you this letter by the will of God. Of God, by God's plan, by God's design. 
In the good times and in the bad times, Paul, he's confident of who he is in Christ. He's confident of his calling and he knows that all things are being worked together for his good. He knows that. And so can we say the same things in our lives? He goes on to say this to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. In other versions, the the words holy people actually says saints. It says saints. Now, I thought, aren't saints those people who have who are dead and gone, who have already passed away into glory, and people that had to, had to have performed like two documented miracles and a committee voted on their sainthood and all this. Well, I guess that's the Catholic Church uh, uh, way of making saints. I don't know. I don't find the, the, there's a biblical pattern for that uh, in the Bible, but, uh, the, but Paul calls Christians saints. Holy people. In the letter of the, to the Ephesians church, nine times Paul uses the word saints or holy people to refer to the Christians there. These are, just, these are people just like you and me. People who are flawed, people who are doing their very best to live out their faith in this pagan world and they're taking steps forward and sometimes a few steps back living out their faith and Paul calls them saints. Now a saint is anyone who has trusted Christ for their salvation, repented of their sins, received the Holy Spirit and has become a child of God. That is a saint. And what that means today is when you came to church you may you may have parked next to a saint. In fact, to your left and to your right, right now, or maybe in front of you or behind you, you are sitting next to a saint. And husbands, hello, it's Mother's Day. If you're sitting next to your wife, you you better say amen. You're sitting next to a saint. So it was written to... Christians. It was this was a book written to God's holy people, his saints. This letter was written uh, specifically to them. So if you're here today and you're not, and you're not a Christian yet, um, what I want to what I want you to see is that you're going to you're going to eavesdrop on a conversation that the apostle Paul is having with the saints. Okay, you're going to hear a letter that's written to a family that maybe you're not a part of yet, but you're being invited into. He goes on to say, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. So Paul is talking to a church that had been faithful over the last eight to ten years in Ephesus. And if you, you research Ephesus and you find that it was a dark, pagan, sinful city. And Paul spent about two years there and it was broken. It was spiritually dark. There was about 250,000 people in that city. And that city was actually dedicated and built around this idol goddess named Diana. You can read all about it in Acts chapter 18, 19, 20. But the story goes is that there was a meteor that had crashed near or in Ephesus in the past, and the people were so enthralled with this rock, and they, car- they used it, and they carved out this beautiful statue, this idol, and they named it the goddess Diana. It was a gift from the gods, like it was a gift from Zeus. Zeus had sent it down, okay? And so they deified this rock and they built this temple around it. And this temple of Diana was actually one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And it was filled with some of the greatest uh, pieces of artwork and artifacts and all of that in the ancient world. But Diana, this false goddess, was worshipped primarily through sexual immorality. And so all around this temple, there were prostitutes, and and there was a very common thing. And it was in this environment that the early church thrived. It was in this context that the gospel took root. It was in this pagan, dark context that Paul says to them, You holy people in Ephesus, you have been faithful. 
He goes on to say in verse 2, it says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in verses 13 through 14, Paul's about to just pour out his heart in praise. Those of you who like praise and worship, Paul is about to share one of the most awesome doxologies in all of Scripture. He's just going to pour out his heart in praise to his God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And actually, in the Greek, this is all one sentence. It's a big run-on sentence. There's absolutely no punctuation in there. So the uh, grammar is a little flawed, but the theology is perfect. <laughs> Verse 3, it says this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Wow. Wow. That's the theme of his song. Now he's going to go into the verses of this praise song. Verse 4. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Jot this down if you're taking notes. You are chosen. You and I are chosen people. God chose us from among the world. He chose us for himself before the creation of the world. He chose you for himself forever. Isn't that amazing to know that you have been chosen by the God of the universe. Even before the creation of the world, he chose you. Now, I remember growing up in uh, like elementary school and, and middle school and stuff like that. I used, to, I used to hate that moment where there's two captains and you're about to play a kickball game, right? And I was so like scrawny and little and skinny and, and awkward and I didn't have really any good kickball skills to speak of. I could barely catch the ball. If I hit it, I hit it off the side of my foot and it was like a foul. I was pitiful. I was bad, so I didn't like that moment when they were picking teams. And the captain would be like, I want him, I want him, I want him. I was always close to the last. And that did not feel good to not be chosen. Have you ever gotten a, a, a rejection letter from a job you applied for or something like that? You applied to go to a college or this or that, and you got a letter and it said, Sorry. No, thank you. We did not choose you. There's, it's not a good feeling not to be chosen. It's almost like a rejection kind of a feeling. But God wants us to know that in spite of our mess, in spite of our imperfections, in spite of our sin and rebellion and all of our issues, because Lord knows we all have issues, God has chosen you. Look at what Charles Spurgeon says. He says, God must have chosen me before I was born because he never would have chosen me afterwards. <laughs> we are chosen people. Let's go on. It says, in love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Number two thing I want you to see from this scripture is I am adopted. I am adopted. This means that the true and living God, the creator of the heavens and earth, by grace has made believers members of his beloved family. And that means that we have all the rights and all the responsibilities that goes along with being his sons and daughters. And I can hardly think of anything more comforting, more nourishing, more uplifting, more glorious than, than when we trust Christ, we are made into sons and daughters of the Creator God. And that truth all by itself makes me just want to shout, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! I am a child of the living God. I am adopted into his family. Verse 7 continues. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood. Wow, this is awesome. The forgiveness of sins 
in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. Number three thing I want you to see this morning is I am redeemed. I am redeemed. I am bought back and not just barely redeemed, not just a little bit redeemed or even reluctantly redeemed. No, in Christ, you are abundantly and completely redeemed. You, you know that uh, I think it's a Big Daddy Weave song that's been on the radio in the last few years. But the words are so powerful and meaningful to me. It goes something like this. It seems like all I can see was the struggle. Haunted by ghosts that lived in my past. Bound up in shackles of all of my failures. Wondering how long is this going to last. Then you look at this prisoner And you say to me, son, stop fighting a fight that's already been won. And it goes on to say these powerful words. I am redeemed. I have been set free. So I'm going to shake off these heavy chains, right? And I'm going to wipe away every stain because now I am not who I used to be. No, I am redeemed. So I've been chosen I've been adopted, and I've been redeemed. Let's keep reading. It says, with all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. To be put into into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth, under Christ. Verse 11 says, look at this, in him. Look at how many times the Bible says in him. Paul's making a, a really profound point that our identity is nowhere else but in him. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who, look at this, Paul's convinced of this truth right here, who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Verse 12, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. Verse 13, and you also were, look at this, Included in Christ. When you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Jot this down if you're taking notes with me. I am included. You were not left out. You were not overlooked. And God did not discriminate against you. He did not look. He didn't care about what color you are. He didn't care about what country you come from, what color your hair is, how many tattoos you have, how many piercings you have. No, in Christ, God has included you. It goes on to say this. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. Boy, this is powerful. The promised Holy Spirit. Who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. And then he says again, to the praise of his glory. So not only are you included, but now you are marked. The Holy Spirit. After after you have put your faith in Christ, after you have trusted him for your salvation, that precious Holy Spirit comes inside of you and marks you. He marks you as like a seal. He seals you in as a and who is a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. So number five, I am marked. The truth is this. This is the bottom line. This is what I want you to grasp from this message today. Your true identity is only found in Christ. In Christ. You may be looking for your identity in this or that. Possessions, money, sex, drugs, alcohol, whatever. Prestige, fame. 
But let me encourage you today, and let me just tell you as your pastor, you will never know your, I, true, your true identity apart from being in Christ. <clears throat> 27 times. 27 times in the book of Ephesians, we see this phrase, in Christ. And Paul makes it clear that as Christians, our identity is only there. As Christians, we do not need to experience what we talked about earlier as far as an identity crisis. Because we have an identity so firm, so solid, so stable, that it should ground us for the rest of our lives. We, my friends, are in Christ. We are in Christ. You may be in trouble right? You may be in difficulty. You may even be in depression or in financial straits or in confusion. And those things might be temporarily true of your life. But there is a greater and more powerful truth that I want you to get a hold of today. And that is you are in Christ. Somebody asked me, well, Pastor Brian, where where are you going to be five years from today? I can tell you right now, I'm going to be in Christ. Well, pastor, where's your church going to be 10 years down the road? I can tell you where we're going to be. We're going to be in Christ. This is our identity as Christians. This is our identity as the church of the living God. We are in Christ. Somebody say amen to that. So. When you're feeling down and out, when you're feeling lost and like you've lost everything, you have nothing and you're just a nobody and you are experiencing this, what I call the identity crisis time in your life, I challenge you this week, even in this moment right here, I challenge you to declare confidently with the Apostle Paul and just say, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed me in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ because I have been chosen. I have been adopted. I have been redeemed. I have been included and I have been marked by the precious Holy Spirit. And all of that is because I am in Christ to the praise of his glory. And my prayer today is that we would boldly abandon any image of ourselves that is not of God. That we'll stop accepting what others have said about us, how others have labeled us, how others have defined us. And we will start believing that God, what God says about you is true. And that he is pleased with how he has created you. And he he defines who you are. He defines your identity, not others not even your feelings, not even your own opinions. He defines your feelings. You are not defined by your successes. You're not defined by your failures. You're not defined by circumstances. You're not defined by how much money you make or the car you drive or the house that you say you own but the bank really owns. You are defined by God. You are defined by your God. Who is your father and you are defined by him and him alone. Somebody say a big amen. Amen. I'm about to stand over here and say amen. Pastor Brian, that was good (laughs) stuff. Man, that was good. I want us to to just declare this this morning. These are words from a, a new song called I Am No Victim. Written by people in Bethel Music. Um, But it has a powerful bridge. And I just want us to declare this together today. It's up on the screen and in your notes. Would you say this with me? I am who he says I am. He is who he says he is. I'm defined by all his promises. Shaped by every word he says. Would you stand with me please? I'm going to invite the worship team back up. 
We're going to enter into this time of prayer like we always do. If you need prayer for anything concerning your life, your identity, anything else, uh, I want to invite you to our ministry team is prayed up and ready to agree with you in prayer. And we're going to believe God to touch you. But I want us to pray. I want us to just declare this one more time. Keep that up on the screen, please. Um, and let's talk about, let's declare this um, one more time, okay? It says this, I am who he says I am. He is who he says he is. I'm defined by all his promises, shaped by every word he says. And Father God, I thank you for your word today. Father, I thank you for the power that, that your word is. Your word is alive and active and, and sharper than any double-edged sword. And it's working powerfully in each of our hearts, Father. And I pray in the name of Jesus that, that each person here under the sound of my voice and even listening on YouTube would grasp the power of being in Christ. They would grasp that their identity is in you. Lord, you have adopted us. You have chosen us. You have redeemed us. You have included us. You have marked us by the precious Holy Spirit. And Lord, we just say thank you. Thank you for our identities. And I pray, Father, that you would strengthen us not to believe the lies of the enemy. Lord, we don't want to empower the liar. Lord, we want to believe the truth. Help us, God, to renew our minds according to the truth of your word so that when we think of who we are, we think your thoughts. We think your truth. And we're not deceived by the lies of the enemy. We give you praise, Lord. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Everybody said a big... Amen. Amen. Church, if you're here today and um, maybe the Lord has brought you here for one reason or another and you are not in the family of God, you have not received salvation, you have not received your, your status as a son and a daughter of the king, maybe today is your day. And it all starts because, listen, you're being invited in the Holy Spirit is inviting you in to the family of God. And so if you've never accepted the Lord, if you've never confessed Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, my goodness, why wait another minute? Why wait another minute? The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off and don't procrastinate. What I encourage you to do is to pray this prayer after me. Mean it from the bottom of your heart and you will be instantly a child of God by His grace. Would you pray this prayer with me? Everybody pray it with me. Just say, Heavenly Father, I come to you today a sinner. I am broken and in need. I am tired of living my life without you. I need you. I believe, God, that you sent your son to die on the cross to pay for my sin. And I believe, God, that you raised him from the dead on the third day so that I could have life by putting my faith and trust in him. You redeem me. You save me. You come into my life and cause me to be born again. I receive it now. And I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I am a child of God. I am a son of the King. I am a daughter of the Most High. Thank you for receiving me into your family today. It's in Jesus' mighty name I pray.